Now we go to Capitol Hill, where yesterday lawmakers heard from survivors of a drone attack in Pakistan. The briefing, organized by Florida Congressman Alan Grayson, gave a rare voice to those who are most affected by the United States drone war program. On hand was the family of 67-year-old Mamina Bibi, who last year was targeted by a drone in a remote village in Pakistan and was thrown 20 feet and killed instantly as she was gathering okra in a field with her two grandchildren who were injured in the strike too. Her family has received no explanation from the U.S. government as to why this happened. Unfortunately, only five members of Congress showed up to the briefing with Congressman Alan Grayson. They include Rush Holt of New Jersey, Jan Schakowsky of Illinois, John Conyers of Michigan, and Rick Nolan of Minnesota. But despite the low turnout, this was a rare event on Capitol Hill in which members of the U.S. government officially acknowledged that these strikes are actually happening and they are destroying lives, something the current and previous administrations in the White House have been reluctant to do. Earlier, I sat down with Congressman Alan Grayson and I asked him what impact he hopes his briefing will have. I think that over time it's going to have a great impact. One of the laws of war, of the use of military force in general, is that we try to spare civilians, we try to spare the innocent. In the case of drones, there have been documented reports of roughly a thousand innocent people who have been killed by these attacks. Virtually every observer says that the chance of killing an innocent is roughly one in five every time we launch one of these attacks. One in five of the victims turns out to be entirely innocent. And there are publicly available lists of almost 200 children who have been killed by these attacks. Um, people have to start to wonder uh, why are we so willing to do this when there's so much collateral damage that's evident here. Well, why do you think it is that the administration has refused to do what you did yesterday, which is acknowledge that this is happening, uh, explain these strikes, and perhaps compensate the victims? Well, I think that to some extent, and I, I, when you say the administration, I'll make it clear that, that this has been a longstanding policy of the U.S. government and not limited to the Obama administration, but to some extent, the military-industrial complex has a policy of denying, obscuring, attacking, uh, and to some degree turning uh, the victims into the supposed oppressors. Um, I, I think that uh, we uh, have made position, taken positions with regard to actual threats to this country uh, that turn out to be somewhat overstated, to say the least, uh, and we avoid other ways of dealing with these problems that are maybe a little more low-tech, maybe a little more difficult in requiring diplomacy, uh, but much more effective. Uh, it seems to me that if we're talking about people whom we regard as our enemies operating on Pakistani territory, the obvious solution is to have the Pakistanis clean up their own mess uh, rather than trying to send our uh, death machines uh, over to the other side of the world uh, and do it for them. Uh, two reports last week alleged that the drone strike, specifically the one that your, your briefing highlighted yesterday, amount to unlawful killings. Uh, do you agree with that claim that these are unlawful killings and should members of the command chain authorizing these strikes all the way to the top be held accountable? Well, what, what, what you're referring to is the, the issue of whether these constitute war crimes. Uh, typically in recent years when you're talking about war crimes, whether in Serbia or in parts of West Africa or otherwise, what that generally has denoted uh, recently is the intentional killing of civilians. I don't think we've seen the intentional killing of innocents. But we've seen actions that seem to inevitably lead to the killing of innocents, whether intentional or not, and raise a grave danger on each occasion. Yesterday, our hearing, we talked about the death of a woman in her 60s, a woman who had never been in political, never been involved in any sort of insurgent activity, um, probably uh, couldn't even name the president of the United States or even find America on a map, uh, and she was killed while doing her gardening. Uh, and her grandchildren who were with her that day were both wounded. Uh, obviously a terrible mistake. Mistakes like this do happen, but they happen with alarming frequency during this drone program. Uh, I think that expecting that an American looking at a screen somewhere in the continental United States and deciding on the basis of what he sees on that screen uh, through telemetry who lives and who dies at locations eight or 9,000 miles away is just too hard to do and too hard to do accurately. Frankly, it seems like hubris. 
Uh, I want to shift gears here quick to something that happened on the House Intelligence Committee yesterday during the hearing when there was this exchange between Chairman Mike Rogers and Congressman Adam Schiff over whether or not the committee was informed of the NSA's program which spied on world leaders. Here's just a quick clip of the exchange. I'd be interested to know. Mr. Chairman, we, and we we'll, would be we'll happy to take, take you session. down to the committee and, and spend a couple of hours going through mounds of product that would allow a member to be as informed as a member wishes to be on sources and methods and all activities of the intelligence community under the national intelligence framework. Well, I, I would just say, and I'll, I, I just think this, we need to be careful about I, what I, you're talking I, about, I, but I think we, it's we disingenuous we, to we, use the classification. Well, and, and I think it would be disingenuous, Mr. Chairman, if you're suggesting we have information if we don't have it. You've alleged that Chairman Rogers' Intelligence Committee has withheld intelligence documents from you in the past. And here we see an argument, a public argument, between two members of the committee over what they knew and when they knew about an NSA program. What sort of faith should the American people have in the Congressional Intelligence Committees to provide oversight? A little or none. Uh, in fact, what we see from, the congressional, from these Congressional Oversight Committees regarding our so-called intelligence community uh, is not that they're performing oversight, rather they're overlooking uh, and systematically doing so. I think that they've become apologists for the spying industrial complex uh, and, and that I have literally never seen them do anything other than rationalize these, in some cases, gross abuses and constitutional violations, particularly with regard to domestic surveillance. When it comes to these issues of drones and domestic surveillance, uh, these issues typically transcend party lines, and you find progressive Democrats like yourself working with libertarian Republicans, like some in the Tea Party. Uh, as someone who's leveled quite a bit of criticism at the Tea Party, what do you make of these new political coalitions that have formed in recent months in light of these uh, revelations, both about drones and surveillance? Well, I think that the real division you see these days is not between liberals and conservatives on these issues or for that matter between Democrats or Republicans. I think the, the difference is between members who are principled uh, and members who are scared. Uh, the, the members who are principled understand that we have a constitution that requires probable cause and particularity. Those are the explicit terms of the Fourth Amendment. You can't get, the go the, you can't get information about people's private affairs unless you can demonstrate that either they are involved in criminal activity or there's reason to believe that they have information about other being, people being involved in criminal activity. That's the standard. What's happening instead is a, a dragnet approach where the government collects everything and then purports to sift through it to try to find evidence of wrongdoing, which is directly contrary to our privacy, our dignity as human beings, and our rights under the Constitution. Those of us who are principled understand that and stand against it. Those of us who are fearful feel that every time the, word, the phrase 9-11 gets repeated, they have to forget everything they know about the U.S. Constitution and the oath they swore to uphold it. U.S. Representative Alan Grayson from Florida, thank you.